You see, at this point, if you haven't heard of Korra or have yet to play her, dear god, you've been missing out. Not only is she one of the strongest offensively due to stat stick ability scaling, and not only has she got great utility-based defense for missions to hold off enemies, but when it comes to needing a Warframe to solo survival, excavation, or even defense endless endurance missions and hold that door, she's absolutely one of the best for it and reaps rewards like no other. So let's have a little look at her kit and what builds to expect whilst playing her. As always, guys, timestamps are added beneath the description. Firstly, let's break down her kit, starting off with her passive. Korra's companion combat venery will fight alongside Korra at all times and buff Korra's movement speed with a cheeky 15% increase whilst venery is alive. However, if venery does go and die, you will go and lose the buff and venery goes on the 45 second based cooldown. Now, you can go ahead and summon venery back using Korra's third ability, but we'll cover that a little bit later. Korra's first ability is Whip Claw. Korra lashes out her whip weapon, whip cracking through enemies and dealing IPS damage spread evenly against them. Now, Whip Claw is what we call a pseudo-exalted ability. This is one of the very few select abilities within Warframe, where instead of damage coming solely just from strength or mods within the Warframe build, it can also benefit from mods from whatever is equipped on your current melee weapon. Now, that's to put it somewhat briefly. I won't be going too in-depth with this in this video. If you know, you know. If you don't, would you guys want to see a separate video covering this related topic? Let me know. But with these kind of abilities, we are using melee weapons to hold mods that affect this ability's damage, and we call those stat sticks. I'll be getting to that later in a build and show what affects the damage for Whipclaw and how we can get the most out of this ability. Korra's second ability is Ensnare. And this is also Korra's subsumable ability that goes into the helmet. Korra uses her whip to bind a singular target in livid metal in which any enemies who are nearby will get clumped up and also ensnared joining the original user who is cast upon. This ability is a great way to group up enemies and it's been used in quite a few other Warframe builds as it's easily spammable and helps AoE nuke builds or can even be used defensively in choke points to hold any enemy advances. Korra's third ability is Venery. So I'm just going to go and keep this part simple and short. Venery comes with three different modes that you can go ahead and control. Starting off with the attack mode. If you hover over an enemy and cycle to the attack mode, it'll make a Venery single out that target, dealing slash damage and slash box to them whilst also ensnaring them. Cycling over to her protect mode next will cause Venery to become a guardian for either Korra or herself. During this time, Venery will go ahead and cast a tail whip to the nearest enemy, which knocks them down and disarms them. And I will warn you, it's not always the nearest enemy, but it does go ahead and say that. And finally, her last cycle is the heal mode, in which should be pretty self-explanatory, but Venery basically casts like a healing aura around her and will follow whoever you mark to be healed in short terms. So these commands are good and all, but they're not always that important impactful in situations and due to this we're going to make sure that for this build in this video we'll be subsuming out this ability do keep in mind that we don't lose venery she is our passive she will remain but she has no commands and does her own thing so what we want to go and do is fill in this gap with a helm of ability that gives us energy returns now whichever one you want to go and put on is up to you but a good common one that synergizes extremely well is gara's spectra rage ability more importantly the augment from this ability in which any enemies that die within the circle of mirrors will have a chance of dropping energy orbs. This allows us to keep casting and spamming our whip claw ability without needing to worry about energy returns. Now don't worry if you don't have this augment or this option, do go and try other abilities like dispensary. It will also go and work, but you'll get most out of it if you go and run equilibrium in your build. Korra's fourth ability is Strangle Dome. Korra can cast this ability in two different positions, which weaves a dome of living chains and staring enemies who come close to it, inflicting damage over time to them. Enemies not caught by this dome will try and shoot and kill the enemies who are caught inside. Now, this makes this ability great as a distractionary tool, but it also taunts those enemies off you, making you not the target. All entangled enemies will receive a 200% increase for all damage from weapons and abilities except Korra's Whip Claw ability, but that deals the usual amount. However, Korra's Whip Claw inflicts 50% of its damage dealt to all other enemies that aren't targeted within the dome. So basically, this encourages you to cast your dome, wrap up and entangle the enemies, and then start cracking away at one target within the dome and spread and inflict damage all across the other enemies caught inside. This offers great ability synergy, and this is the main concept of the build and playstyle we will be focusing on. Alrighty then, enough about abilities, let's talk builds. Right, now before we even begin to show a build, I'm going to stress that Korra has so 
so much room to flex into whatever the user needs that it's actually crazy how many different builds, varieties, and versions I've seen, but basically all boiled down to the same gameplay and style. Now, however, for my build, I went with the triple augment focus. Spectre Rage, as mentioned earlier within the ability section, gives us a way to benefit energy returns. Now, this is going to be quite a zone control heavy related build. So abilities that cater to that playstyle are going to help here, like Dispensary, for example. I'll be placing the Spectre Rage ability within the Strangle Dome, and any enemies killed within those will go ahead and drop those extra energy. Accumulated Whip Claw builds up our Whip Claw damage, stacking up to a maximum return of 350% for each and every time we hit at least three enemies with our first ability. This is a great way to pump up damage without having to focus strength within the build. And finally, we got Pilfering Strangle Dome. Now, enemies, when killed being caught inside the dome, will have a 65% chance of dropping additional loot. This is great for farming materials or gaining extra life support during survival missions or even an extra power cell during the excavation mission. Either way, it's super nice to have in, but it's not 100% required by all means. So from here onwards, the build is so flexible, but here's what you really need to know. Duration in this build helps our quality of life with longer length for our strangle dome ability and instead duration if we need to go and cast it. Take that if you like the sound of it. Your efficiency will need to be higher if you are not subsuming in a helm of ability, as this build will spam your first ability quite a lot. So energy return in one way or another is vital. And so the range is 100 100% heavily situational depending on the tile set, which faction you're fighting against, and which hallway you're going to try and choke point the enemy into. It's really up to you to take whatever fits you. And finally, we've got strength, which isn't super important here. Whip Claw's damage is mostly coming from the stat stick and augment that we can leave strength basically where it is. If you wanted to, you could hurt it a little, but it's really your call. As for everything else, we got a couple of usual survival methods such as Prime Short Footed and Rolling Guard in case we get into trouble. And then the Aura Mod is also flexible here as well. For the Arcanes, there's a few decent switch ups, so taking any of these will also help you, but it's pretty optional to what you'll be needing, thankfully. Archon Shards. So I mostly went for the quality of life focus within my build. Now, sure, I don't go ahead and get more rampant damage, but I felt like the Crimson Mods for duration just felt so much nicer to let me sit back a little bit more with my timings, so I mainly went for that. Now, I do also have one Talforge Amber Shard in here, but honestly, it's not that important. It just helps me with a little bit of extra car speed, again, for some more quality of life. My damage already feels great within this build, and the utility is already covered anyways. How about that stat stick then? Okay, so for my stat stick, this really came down to two options for me personally. Both of them are in card and options, and both of them relying on what Riven rolls I had available. So before we get into that, on screen are some stat stick weapons that are good for you to choose from. Again, remember, the idea of a stat stick is that we aren't using the melee weapon itself. We're only wanting to benefit from the mods that we put on the melee weapon. And this is how Korra's Whip Claws formula looks right here. So any mod that falls under these categories will help us deal more damage with our Whip Claw ability. This is mostly where the build investment goes into. A good rolled ribbon can make quite a drastic difference in terms of how well your build performs, but even a half decent ribbon with rolls for damage, crit chance, crit damage, or elementals alone would also be an upgrade, so don't sweat it too much if you cannot min-max to the perfect roll. The game's the game, baby. Welcome to Riven RNG. And it's to know that Korra's Whip Claw does all three basic physical elements, but we can help scale the side of Slash she does by adding in a Slash mod to help the status proc chance lean towards those cheeky bleed procs, in which would scale off most of the mods that we already have inside this build as well. So this build already hits hard, but the bleed procs just complement the leftovers and give us breathing room to scale the build further into Steel Path Endurance Runs. Okay, so what about Venery's build? Okay, so up on screen is a quick idea of a build. Now, I personally prefer Venery to be offensive. Since we can run two companions with Korra in mind, I like my Venery to do things and be a bit more impactful if she's going to be at my side, even if I can't control her. My companion itself, I will usually use for the utility. So the combination works well between both of them. Alrighty then, so how are we play in this build? Right, so this build is going to be so simple to play that you're going to want something nice to watch on a second screen or run some really chill music in the background because if done correctly with your positioning, you won't really run into 
many problems with a build like this. First things first, we want mostly two things. Number one, since we're primarily focusing on endurance content, survivals as shown here in the footage, for example, we want to make sure that wherever we cast a strangle dome would be the most ideal spot as enemies are funneling towards it. And keep in mind, you do have two casts of this ability, so you can actually hold two choke points in defense missions, for example. Anyways, go look for that good area where enemies are shoulder to shoulder and on top of each other. This will help you pinpoint where to place your strangle dome. And for number two, I'm going to be needing a little bit of energy to go and get the build rolling. And it shouldn't take too long. You can do this in a few different ways, but it's okay to have a backup primary or secondary weapon and get a couple of kills. If you have a Zenric Focus School, that also works, or use the Helminth Subsumed ability to get things rolling. Heck, even a companion like Death Cube can also go and help out here. And speaking of focus schools earlier, I just want to go and quickly mention that I prefer to go and use the Naramon focus school to keep my combo count from decaying in a big chunk. This way, it keeps my damage up and I don't have to worry about combo durations as much, but it's entirely up to you as which focus school you want to go and take. So then, now that I'm set up, we're going to place down a strangle dome and let enemies trickle in towards it. Enemies like Eximus, especially with their overguard up, or Acolytes won't get caught inside due to their resistances, so keep those in mind. And none of us will also be quite a pain in the ass as well. However, once those enemies are caught, cast your Spectre Rage ability within the dome area, you're basically stacking these abilities on top of one another, and then from there, just get killing. Whip Claw and Whip Crack your way to easy rewards, especially if you're utilizing the Pilfer and Strangle Dome Augment. And that's just about it to the ability rotations, nice and simple. This build works fantastic whether you're solo or in a group format. You're always going to bring something to the team, and they'll always be happy to go and see a Korra in defense styled missions. Overall, this is a more simplistic build to go ahead and use, but obviously, it has a few different areas to invest into so if you're not quite there yet with everything don't worry it still comes in handy to have an understanding of it for now in case you meet a Korra within your missions and you know how to benefit from her rotations and as always guys if you did enjoy today's video please go and leave it with a cheeky like share the video with a friend if you think it will help them and if you're new to the channel go ahead and subscribe for future videos but as always guys i'll be seeing you guys again in the next video